Hey everyone, it's Leanne and earlier this week I had the great pleasure and honor of sitting down with my good friend Heather Reed at Planner Protect. It was a very casual chat. In fact, it came up a couple weeks ago when we were having a phone chat or maybe it was a Zoom meeting and about 20 minutes into the conversation we both kind of said, you know, it would have been really great if we recorded this and made it made it a public forum because we were getting into such great dialogue. So that's what prompted this chat earlier this week that um, first went live on my Facebook page. And now of course it's uploaded to YouTube and you can still find it over on Facebook. So it's an hour long chat with Heather Reed. Um, she's delightful. She's got some incredible insights about where the industry is going, how we're feeling right now. And she's going to talk a little bit about her project, about chronicling some of the lessons that we've learned as we've gone through this uncertain time with rebookings and canceled meetings. So if you have an hour to kill, take a listen. I hope you enjoy. And if you'd like to see more Tea Time Chats, let me know. Enjoy the video. Bye for now. How are you? Good. How are you, Leanne? <gasps> I'm Great good. I'm glad you. that we were able to connect finally. It feels uh, weeks since we were able to chat like this. It has been actually, it's been a few weeks. Some days feel like they've taken forever. Other days seem to fly. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I've been, I, I don't know about you, but I'm just as busy now as I was before this all hit. In fact, my, my days are even busier. Like it's just, I can't, I can't catch up. Like it's just <laughs> keeps coming at me. So uh but, uh, I am self-inflicted busy at this point, <laughs> yeah. which I would prefer to be busy. I, I tend to be on or off and uh, I don't serve anyone well when I'm off. And so keeping busy has certainly been uh, beneficial for me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I know you and I've had a great conversation um, and just what you're doing uh, with your work and uh, yeah, I can only imagine how busy you have been uh, supporting your clients. And you know what? They've been great. Um, I, I can't say they've all been great in all transparency. I do have some clients that um, are a bit more demanding than others, um, but they're stressed out too. And yeah. so I, so I understand, I get it. Um, they're, they're stressed out. So um, I'm, I, you know what, Heather? I'm not sure if this has gone live. <laughs> this is on my screen live on Facebook. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, maybe there you go. <laughs> maybe going. between the two of us. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, it's um they um they're all under stress, they're all under pressure, and um, they're answering to their stakeholders. So I get it. Um, but I think the philosophy that Stephen and I have taken, which has always served as well as like to, you know, kill bees with honey or attract <laughs> bees with honey, whatever that is. Um, and, and, you know, you, you'll get a lot further by being more empathetic to the other person's situation. And so that's been our key word the last couple of months mm. is empathy is, you know, what, what are, what is the other person going through? Um, and we're trying to take that stance every time we respond or every time we ask someone of something is like, what are they going through? Yeah. They might not have answers because they're still waiting on board of director approval, or they're waiting on the director of sales and marketing approval. Like there's so many layers on both sides that just trying to be empathetic is the best, best policy, I think. Well, I don't think any of no. us have ever been here before, right? Yeah. So it, you know, it's, uh, uh, what I know the words are uncharted waters, unprecedented, all those words that you don't want to hear anymore, but truly they are, right? They're, we, yeah. None of us have been here before. And, and, you know, if it was an isolated cancellation or a postponement, you know, uh, or even a couple of them, but this is the entire industry that has been put on a great big giant pause and mm -hmm. uh, how you handle that has uh, there's no rule book uh, there's no you know instruction manual that comes with it and and so uh, yeah I I am not luckily my large client for the year just scraped through at the end of February oh, uh, we had uh, 700 uh, medical professionals in Victoria at the end of February and uh, that was just as, you know, there was certainly talk about it and some contingency plans and things like that. But um, I, I just can't even fathom what planners and folks like yourself 
doing the site selection. I can't even imagine what you've gone through. Well, actually, I can a little bit. I'm we're working on a project, but uh, uh, yeah, it's just unbelievable the amount of work that has been invested by planners and by uh, partners and things like that to to unravel this ball of elastics. It's uh, you know. Crazy. You, you said something really interesting. Your end of February client was at least thinking about contingency plans. Yes. None of the clients that I have talked to really did that. And, and maybe I need better clients or maybe, I don't know. No. But <laughs> when the hammer came down, I felt like everybody scrambled and they all scrambled on the exact same day. Because um, that's what happened is our inboxes just got flooded on that yeah. Thursday, the Friday, the Monday, the Tuesday after the hammer came down about what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And it was like the first time they even considered the possibility mm. that it would have to cancel. I had um, one client, she's, oh, she's just adorable and she's so awesome. When the hammer came down, I, I call it that. I don't know if anyone else is calling it that. Maybe it won't catch on. I'm kind of hoping it does. But when the hammer came down, <laughs> On March 12th, my uh, client was to start her citywide on the Sunday. Okay. And she emailed me. And I think within four hours, she had canceled everything she needed to cancel on her end. I had canceled everything I needed to cancel on the hotel end. Wow. And, and it was done. Like she yeah. just went into cancel mode. But her, her funniest story is like, well, now what do I do? I don't have any groceries in the house. I was supposed to be on site all week. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I guess you got to go grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> like, Thank goodness for online know. ordering. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, it's, it's interesting because uh, as you know, we've, uh, you've been one of our interviewees, but I'm uh, mm -hmm. um, working on this uh, chronicling initiative to try to cry and capture some of the stories. And uh, I have to say there are groups that were aware of what was the potential impact of what was coming. Um, and the group that I referenced about, they're a medical uh, doctors association. And okay. so they were very quite aware of, of what the possibilities were. Um, and had we talked about everything from canceling uh, and what the ramifications were for that. Uh, we talked about, you know, what were the uh, on-site requirements for, you know, increased uh, hand sanitizer and uh, the venue that we were at was doing a phenomenal job of, of just really stepping up uh, their sanitation while we were on-site. So there were groups and, and actually we've heard of, of uh, event hosts, uh, so whether they be association or corporate, uh, who were actually planning but I have to say, you're, many of them were caught uh, in that, you know, like, oh my goodness. And not so much that they were caught without knowing what COVID was, but just caught with the impact that was going to fall out because of the, just the, the on-off switch that went off on, on mm -hmm. March 12th when that mm -hmm. uh, pandemic uh, was, was uh, announced. It was, mm -hmm. it was almost like just shutting off the light switch. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's been fascinating to hear um, and be a part of the, the experiences because those that had uh, time and that had some maybe some foresight just because of the kind of clients that they had, the medical clients, the um, groups that were had international attendees, um, some of the planners had uh, been in airports that were starting to get that kind of eerie, empty kind of feel. Um, oh. And so there were some that just had some some lead time, if you will. Um, and and they were differently prepared. They're not going to say better prepared, but differently prepared um, in how they were able to handle just the lights going out. Uh, so yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I'm excited about uh, your Chronicle study. And although this time today isn't really to promote the Chronicle study, no, but no. I want it to be about that too, because Stephen and I are now looking at our client care strategy. And mm. before COVID, we had a client care strategy where meeting planners got um, notes every month to remind them of what's coming up or what should be mm. coming up that month. So, you know, at eight months out from the program, you should start thinking about this, this and that. And here's what you need to get started, blah, blah, blah. 
what I'm looking forward to uh, about your chronicles is able, I'm hoping to take some of the best practices and advice and the learnings from that and create a client care strategy that more centers on the risk mitigation piece. Um, because I think now, I think everyone is very sensitive to it, mm. but what does that look like as we start planning our 2022 programs or our 2023 programs? So that's what I'm looking forward to about the Chronicles is you're going to have those nuggets of wisdom in there that I'm really hoping to steal and say, okay, so I need to remind my client at a year out that these are the things that they should start thinking about and being ahead of the curve versus what happened to most of us now is being playing a game of catch up. So I'm excited. Yeah, it, uh, I'm excited too. Um, we've, we've kept, it's interesting because when I first, uh, you know, it was one of those ideas is how can I help, right? It's uh, mm. because I wasn't directly affected with my, my business uh, with having to cancel anything. I, yeah. I just, I was like, what can I do? What, how can I help? And uh, uh, it was, it was just capturing. I, I love the academic side of our industry and, and it's probably why I love contracts, but uh, it just was a way of capturing. And what I started out and what I thought the, what they thought the end product would be, would be best practices. And I believe that there will be some best practices, but I think if we've learned anything, and I must say that this, I, I'm now in partnership with Heidi Wilker, who has been an independent retired um, from Blessed Events uh, was her, the name of her company. Uh, we have, we've learned that we've done 24 interviews and there are 24 different ways of doing the unraveling. So one might expect, you know, that we'll see some consistency, but uh, yeah. I think there's, but, but in every single interview without fail, there have been a couple of just great nuggets that you just kind of go, oh, wow. So if by the time we're done these 36 interviews, if there are 36 golden nuggets that we can share, then I feel like even though it may not be the definitive, you know, Bible of risk management on how to unravel, you know, uh, an event, it at least will give uh, planners some reason to, some things to consider. Mm -hmm. And, and the other thing is, is that hopefully they consider it when they aren't in that situation, because mm -hmm. I don't think there's any uh, handbook that is ever going to help every planner in what they have to go through. And I, I think it is a case by case by case uh, situation of what are the priorities, who are the, the stakeholders, you know, what are our obligations, what are the other parties obligations, how do they respond, there's just so many things. So it's, it is truly um, uh, it has just been an enormous, enormous privilege to sit and uh, I, I constantly am just saying I'm in awe. I'm in yeah. awe. I need to find a new word for awe <laughs> because it's just, it's amazing. And, and uh, yeah, I, I just hope that uh, we have a few more spots. So we have a couple of, you know, a couple more people, but we, it really is fascinating, Leanne. So. Okay, so I heard you said you had a few more spots. Um, after the call today, if you're still looking for people, um, I do have a couple clients that might be interested oh, in fantastic. sharing their story. Awesome. Um, so let's connect on those people um, after our call today. But um, as you were talking, I don't know why I thought of this, but it would be interesting to find out um, so I got to back up. So I'm a, I'm a CMP, but I've been a CMP for 10 years. So if you were to ask me what I learned in CMP, I could not tell you it's been that long, but I'd be interested to hear from newer CMPs or people going through the CMP program right now about what they're learning around, mm -hmm. um, risk mitigation and crisis management and stuff like that. Because it almost sounds like you've got 24 stories and they're all different. It sounds like maybe there isn't a, a handbook for this. Maybe we all just made it up as we were going along. And that's what you're chronicling now is, you know, how are people making this stuff up? And you have, I have to wonder if training in the future, whether it's CMP or um, the universities, whoever's offering credentials in our field, if this doesn't create a whole lot of content for people to have to learn. Um, so next time it's not 24 different stories, but there's actually some structure and there's actually some proceeds that people have to go to, to get to the end result. I don't know. 
I'm just yeah. throwing it out there. I'd love to yeah. hear from people if they think that's yeah. going to happen, but yeah, yeah. It, would be, it would be interesting. And I think if there was time on our side, then maybe a rule book would apply. But I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, when things had to happen so quickly in those first few days, particularly for the events that were really imminent, um, mm -hmm. I think it was, you know, fly by the seat of your pants, decide what the priorities are and just make it happen. Yep. And I think that's one of the resounding things is that planners and uh, people like yourselves have just made it happen. Um, and, and that's been remarkable. Uh, I think there's room for a structure to it. I think if we were really pushed to shove, shove to push, I don't know which way you say it, but anyways, if we were really made to say, okay, was there an order? And then we had, you know, eight hours to sit with each planner. I suspect we would find that there are some consistencies. Um, I know one of the, I know one consistency would be that it was about attendee communication and sponsor attend, uh, sponsor communication right away. Like, honestly, I think probably every one of them was that it was, those were the priorities. Um, and so there might be some bones to that, um, that, that and, and I don't want to make any kind of uh, speculation because what we're doing is we're just listening at this point and we'll take the 36 transcripts and, and Heidi's got kind of a analytical brain and I've got an analytical brain and I think we'll try and find what we can of those uh, commonalities that but then at the same time, every event is unique. And so maybe every risk management process needs to be slightly unique um, yeah. to address, you know, it, it's just, it's fascinating. That's why I just keep saying it's fascinating. And I wish everyone had the front row seat that Heidi and I have had to the oh. brilliance of our peers. Well, and that's, you, you've obviously chosen people or they've approached you because they've had something to share that people can learn from, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, but, but you're right. It does go to show how resilient and how people mm -hmm. in our industry just uh, turn their time and their talents into strengths as we were working through this. And yeah, yeah I'm, you know, what scares me too, is I'm, I'm hopeful we don't lose some of that talent to other industries. Mm -hmm. If our industry doesn't bounce back in time, um, I wonder if that's a real risk. And, and listen, I've, I haven't talked to anybody that's thinking about changing industries. Where would they even go? Because there's all kinds of industries that are in trouble. But it would be a darn shame if we started oh. to lose some of this talent um, because our industry just can't, can't afford that much talent anymore because of the, the nature of, the, of meetings going forward. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's actually a, an, an insightful question and something to consider because it, it's true. It's, I think there's actually when Heidi and I got started, we said, I think we can create a perfect avatar of the type of person that is drawn to this role mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. just because of the characteristics that, that obviously these planners have demonstrated through this challenge. And yeah, it would be a shame to lose the, just the professionalism, the, the brilliance, the um, and I would say it's on both sides. I think one of the things that I really want to art, articulate is that what we've heard is just the kindness and the empathy and the willingness to work together from both sides of the table, both sides of the event hosts with the suppliers, the partners, the venues, the AV companies, the entertainers. Um, it really has been... Uh, remarkable to hear. Uh, we ask one of our questions is about, you know, has there been any negative pushback? And there might be an isolated, you know, situation, it was particularly early on, when yeah. people were, were saying, I'm not doing it because of optics or fear, rather than true force majeure situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm telling you, after a certain date, it was all about let's get through this together. So um, yeah, I, I really to your to your question, though, I, I really hope that those that have this desire to be in this industry have work to come back to. Uh, well, it'd be a shame. <laughs> and, and you bring up a good segment of the industry, uh, the salespeople, whether it's AV wow. sales, hotel sales, there's a skill that's transferable, right? Mm -hmm. So you could see some of those people move to other industries. And who knows what their reasons might be. It could be sheerly they just need to get a job, um, which is fair. You need to yeah. support you and your family first and foremost. 
But secondly, they've been prepped through the ringer. I mean, yeah. I, you and I think we were on the phone a lot during the early days. Those people trump us right. every, every single time. And that's not what they signed up for, right? They yeah. did not go into hotel sales to manage cancellations and watch their revenue disappear, yeah. right? Because their salary and bonus structure is tied to the revenue that the meetings bring in. So, yeah. you know, it's not what they signed up for. And so are we going to lose them to other industries, which again is a shame, but oh, it's certainly absolutely. possible because there's lots of industries that, and please don't get any great ideas, hotel salespeople, because we want you, but there's lots of <laughs> we industries. Need you. <laughs> yeah, we need to, but there's some ind industries that were not affected and sales is such a transferable skill that they could potentially get another job like that, depending on yeah. where you're located. Right. So yeah, I just, I, you're, I think we're going to start to see that, um, you know, I've heard some of the furloughed uh, salespeople are going back to the office and working for the property mm -hmm. or the destination, which is great, but not all of them. And it's only a matter of weeks or months where those people are just like, forget it. I can't wait. This is ridiculous, no. right? No, and that must be oh. so hard. I, I, I can't even begin to imagine. I can try to understand and empathize, but I cannot imagine having that rug literally just pulled out um, from yeah. underneath. And if you're doing what you love every day to have that missing in your life must be devastating. Um, maybe oh. the, you know, a, a couple of weeks of it might be a nice break because I think our industry lived at such a pace that was probably not sustainable for a lot of people. Um, when I look and I hear and see posts that say, I'm seeing my family again. Well, you know what, that's not a bad thing. Um, but yet I, a livelihood that is a bad thing when you lose yeah. your livelihood um, yeah. that, that just must be crushing um, and I think actually so. we've also heard survivor's guilt so there are those in our industry who are you know feeling guilty for having jobs when yes. our really our loved ones and I mean that respectfully our loved ones who we work alongside every day mm -hmm. are without jobs and don't know when they're going to have jobs again um, and that's very real too, is that survivor guilt. If, uh, that's how someone else coined it. Um, yeah. and, and I'm like, oh, that is so true. Because really, even those of us that are working now may not be working if this industry doesn't come back online in six months or eight months or 10 months. Uh, it, you know, who knows what further cuts will be made. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a complicated, complicated time. Oh, I love that one about survivor's guilt, because then those people downplay their true talents because they don't <laughs> want to brag or have an ego around why they're still standing and someone yes. else was let go. So like our entire talent pool has just been like squashed, right? Like everyone just nobody learned anything, right? We just don't need to be on the same playing field. And it's just... Yeah, that's yeah. sad too, right? It is. The, it is. Oh, yeah. You raise an interesting uh, comment about enjoying this time because I'm like you. I've actually quite, I've found the blessing in, in, uh, the, in the circumstance. And um, one of the biggest things for our family is uh, we have two very active boys who play sports. Um, yes. One of my boys, he's still young enough. He plays multiple sports. So when all those ended and he's a, he's a pretty uh, driven kid. So he's found yeah. other activities. We're not worried about him, but the restrictions are starting to get lifted. And mm. uh, one of his hockey coaches emailed us on the weekend and said, Hey, we've got some ice time. Does Nolan want to come out? And my husband and I were like, um, uh, uh, no, I just kind of want to sit on my lawn chair in the backyard. And mm. <laughs> we, we've gotten so used to this new life where we're not running our kids all over town yep. that when now, when the invitations are, and, and it's going to happen for baseball soon, you know it, right? Like, and yep. if your kid plays soccer, that's coming first. Um, we're, I'm, we're kind of comfortable. <laughs> I'm going to have to wake myself up, fill my car with gas and get back out there with my kids and I'm just not sure back I'm on that hamster wheel <laughs> yeah and, and maybe much. that maybe that will be that that people are more judicious and selective with what they do with their time and and that's not a bad thing it uh, uh particularly I feel for young families I know 
Um, I had the privilege of, of being able to work from home for all of the years that my kids were, were growing up and they're gone, they're raised. Um, and, uh, uh, but even that I had flexibility because I had a home-based business. I was able yeah. to parents that are like, I, I look at our industry who so many of our, of our colleagues travel how many multiple weeks of the year and then carry that full threshold of work at home and, and, you know, want their kids to have everything. I, I feel for what, where parents were at. So maybe that is a silver lining coming out of this is that maybe kids will realize they were perhaps over programmed and, and, you know, maybe they yeah. too will want to take a little bit slower uh, pace of life at uh, um, yeah, I'm glad I'm not making those choices. And, and yeah, uh, <laughs> that, uh, yeah I, I feel but, well, and good luck to your son, because it, it'll oh. depend on each kid too, right? Like it depends on how driven and how motivated, how, you know, how much of a pace he wants for himself. And it, uh, yeah. It, well, you're right. It's very true. He's always been the one to drive the, the bus on this. And so yeah. if he wants to go, yeah, we're going. Yeah. Um, but he's all also fallen into this great routine of trying new activities. Mm -hmm. So he's the kind of kid that is busy no matter what. And, but he's now he's busy with other stuff. And so it'll be interesting to see now yeah. if he wants to let go of some of these new hobbies he's created to go back to his old life of hockey practice, followed by baseball practice, you know, followed by basketball practice. And then we go home and grab a quick bite to eat before we do it all over again. Yeah. So yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. So, but yeah, I, I don't know if you saw in the background, my husband got up, we've been, we're really lucky. I'm, I'm really lucky because I travel a lot for work as yeah. you do Heather as well. And we see each other out and about, um, Sean works from home and always has worked from home. Yeah. So when I'm away for travel for work, the boys have him to lean on. Yeah. Um, so this has affected, I think, Sean more than so than anything, because mm. he carried the brunt of kind of the household management. Yeah. Um, and now that's what switched. We're kind of playing a little bit of role reversal now because yeah. his work is still full time. So he's in technology and they've ramped up versus slowed down. And because I've, you know, technically kind of slowed down, we've kind of done a bit of a role reversal where I'm now the primary get the kids to their things. Um, my son has a job at Superstore, so he's got to go okay. to work. Yep. So I, I'm the one who's doing that so Sean can work. Uh, as opposed to before where he would take the time to get the kids to places so I could work and travel and, and yada, yeah. yada, yada. So well, there might be some appreciation of each other's roles. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there's been a lot of appreciation over well, here. Well, my husband retired uh, oh. January 17th. And so then we were out. We took off on the 18th to go west. And that was the last right. kind of thing that I uh, uh, or one of the last things. And then I went to Victoria for a week for the conference at the end of February. And I have to say it's an adjustment and all of a sudden he's home because of retirement, but then, but he's home because of COVID and I have always yeah. been a home-based entrepreneur. And uh, uh, so I've realized in all of this that, uh, you know, the, the phrase, I, I'm a people person. It's like, okay, I need more than just one person in, yeah. my, in my environment. I am not a person person. I am definitely a people person, but uh, yeah, it's been interesting to, you know, um, for the adjustment to, mm -hmm. you know, for he was at home and the first few weeks were kind of cool and exciting. And now it's just like, okay, yeah, we're home 24 seven. So um, I don't know what he'll do with his time when this lifts it. Uh, he has yet to discover truly actually what he will do with his time. So it's, I yeah. think everybody's going to adjust. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You're right. This was going to be his time of like self-exploration. Ah, and yeah. now <laughs> all he's doing is cleaning closets. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, poor guy. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh. Well, this time it, it uh, challenges even the, the best of us introverts. Um, I, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm, I'm a self-professed introvert. I'll tell anyone I'm an introvert. Um, but I need to get out. Like I need to yeah. see my friends. I need to see people in the industry. Um, and so we've been doing backyard, uh, get togethers with our friends. Oh. Um, at first it was just the girls. So there was, uh, four of us girls who would get together at four different corners of the yard. And then they opened it up to six people 
get together in BC. So we did that on the weekend. Um, and it, I mean, it was great, right? We all have a yard that can support six people <laughs> sitting uh, apart from one another. But yeah, the, it's the groups, right? It's the groups of 50 people, 100 people. Yeah. Like, will we ever see a go west again? Will we ever do a rendezvous in a bar ever again? Like, those are questions that neither you and I can answer. Um, Everybody seems to say it's when a vaccine has been developed. And, yeah. and yet, you know, how long does it take to do a vaccine? And we'll have people, people have short term memories. Although, you know, I, I think we said the same things when uh, SARS happened. We said the same things yeah. when 9-11 with, you know, uh, Zika, yeah. all of those things. People won't travel, people won't do things. And yet we find ourselves coming back together all the time yeah. because we need that connection we need to feed off of someone else's energy just to restore our own uh, whether we're yeah. introverts or extroverts i think probably all of us are hardwired for some level of connection uh, yeah connection and ideas right yeah. whether you get yeah. ideas from a group of 50 or a group of two there's always knowledge sharing and so you're right it's got to happen in some way shape or form now heather are you an introvert or an extrovert I am an, I am an introvert that is, is, what's the word? Is there like an ambivert or something yes. like that? I think there yeah. is a, a hybrid or omnivert, or, something like that. Some, but omnivore, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so that's maybe where I'm getting confused. You're right. It's not omnivert, know. it's omnivore. Anyways, I, yeah. I very much am, uh, I need my, I need my quiet time. That's how I refuel but I don't need a lot of quiet time. I very much am uh, an extrovert when it comes to, I thrive on being with people. Um, at, uh, and the irony was always that I had a home-based office and I was home, I've been home-based office since 1994. So long- oh, I know long before it was even fashionable or cool to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very much fed by being with people. Although yeah. I very much hit a wall where I then go, oh, it's time to retreat and I'm done. <laughs> um, so yeah. I wouldn't say that I'm a full on extrovert. Um, okay. There are elements of me that's very much, nope, I need to get out of here. I need to be by myself. <laughs> so. I need to, and you're right. I need to find the word for it. Cause I think yes. I'm that too, which is, I think uh, it is ambivert or I think it's omnivert. Ambivert. Yeah. <laughs> or something know. like that. Maybe weird. I don't but. know. <laughs> Yeah, I should know what the word is, but um, how are you finding Zoom meetings with a lot of people on them? Well, like, let's say it's a Zoom with 10 or 12 people. I actually, I relayed this, uh, this observation the other day. I've been a member of uh, PCMA, uh, uh, MPI, CANSPEP um, for years. So, so MPI is the latest one that I joined. And because of where I'm geographically located, which is London, and the closest chapter is Toronto. So for me to go for a lunch and learn, for example, is an, an entire day commitment. And so I mm -hmm. haven't participated in in-person meetings. And yet in the last seven, eight weeks, I have taken full advantage of every single call possible. And I've met more people. My and I wouldn't say my network because I haven't met them in person. I haven't shaken their hand. I haven't, but just the awareness of who is out there and, and you know, what they might be like, uh, yeah. it, it has just blown up the, the, the uh, world of, of professionals that I am aware of. Um, oh, that's it, awesome. <laughs> it is very cool. Now, that being said, I, I find it flat. I find it's, it's nice, but it's not the same. You can't, uh, I find, you know, looking at, at the screen all day long draining, I find, you know, um, you check yourself and I, I don't care what I look like when I'm talking to someone, that's not what I'm focused on, but I find myself very narcissistically looking at the screen going, okay, do I, I look okay? Like that sort of thing is very draining. Um, and, uh, and I also find it, I don't know, there's something more chaotic about having discussions on Zoom because it's just not the same sense of when someone is going to speak and when they're not going to speak and when you could step forward and maybe, you know, and that leaning in. And I find that much harder to have, you know, a group discussion, even though we can have more people, I just, I don't find it as, um, 
enticing to have. I find myself yeah. listening and then, you know, kind of waiting for the big pregnant pause to then jump in because I don't want to yeah. cut in. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, so I've, I've had the exact same experience. And as an introvert, I'm waiting, waiting, waiting for my chance to jump in. So then I'm an introvert waiting for my chance to jump in. And then I'm the polite Canadian waiting for my chance <laughs> to jump in. I end up not saying anything because I just, and, and I'm so overwhelmed by literally all the voices in my head, right? Because now you got people talking over one another yeah. and they're, and they're literally in your head if yeah. you're wearing a headset. And I feel like I'm like, I'm going to go paranoid. Like, I don't even know what's real <laughs> and what's imaginary anymore. And so I, 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 to your point, I find them extremely draining. Um, and whereas if I was in a room with this exact same 10 people, it wouldn't be draining. It would be energizing. And, yeah. and I would feed better off of those ideas, but yeah, I'm, what are they calling it now? Zoomed out or zoom fatigue, zoom, zoom fatigue. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have yeah. a lot of zoom fatigue, um, especially yeah. with those big groups. Yeah. Um, the small groups like these ones are easy and I, and I do, I feel like you and I could be chatting over a, a dining room table um, because it's just you and me and in, and, and it's cash, yeah. but yeah, when you're, dress like when I'm putting on my makeup for a seven o'clock zoom meeting <laughs> and in the past you know I didn't ever put on makeup because I was never on zoom I only right, put on makeup right. when I traveled <laughs> right like, oh my god <laughs> I need to go shopping for makeup apparently so yeah, yeah so, not fair. so let me ask you I uh, what are you seeing um in are you seeing any new business coming up with any approaches of, of new? I've, I've done a couple of contract reviews the last few weeks and uh, I'm just wondering, what are you seeing? What's your pulse on things? Yeah, it's it's great question because it is such a mixed bag, I find. Yeah. So Stephen and I, some of our clients um, are looking to future contracts. In fact, Stephen just had... Um, Six contracts for futures from one client come in uh, today, wow. which was phenomenal well, to see. That? Yay. Yeah, well, that that's great news, but that's only one of all of our clients. And the right. rest of the clients are, are still playing that wait and see game. So a lot of our clients, in fact, I have a client who was interested in doing um, a four-year contract with one brand of hotels. So different locations, coast to coast. Uh, for the next four years. Screech, halt, stop. Nope, we're, we're reevaluating that entire uh, piece of business now. So, so there's two extremes. We've got the one client who's going six contracts signed, clickety boo, and the one client who's like, we might be insolvent, so I can't sign anything. Mm. Uh, and then everything in between. But having said that, and this, so last week was our, um, conference, our conference, yes. direct conference. Yes. We were supposed to be in Vegas. Uh, that's now postponed to August, hopefully going to Vegas in August. Um, so last week they uh, pivoted, sorry. They or pivoted. And, Dude, the new word is shivoted. Yeah, shifted. shifted. Shift like and pivot. Yeah, shifted. <laughs> shifted. So they shifted <laughs> to a virtual meeting, uh, mm. different content, uh, but similar um we still had the partnering with the the suppliers and did okay. the one-on-one -on -one. so different content uh, but some similar elements anyways to make a long story short a lot of the content was uh associate driven so people like me who have success stories about okay. growing their business and there were so many stories of associates who were growing their business during this time and so i'm i'm texting steven through all this and i'm like are we not growing our business? <laughs> what are we doing wrong? But listen, it, it, our business could grow tomorrow and then I'd yeah. have to eat crow for saying that today. So everything yeah. changes on a day-to-day -day basis, but we are seeing a lot of CD associates grow business throughout this mess, um, whether it's current clients signing future contracts or they're getting brand new clients from referrals of their existing clients. Well, so I was going to ask you, do you think with what has transpired, do you think event hosts of all kinds of walks of like corporate association, do 
you think they'll look for more trusted advisors? Because I, I think the DIY approach may have not worked as well as one would think. Um, I, I actually heard, um, I have to give a shout out to Speaker Spotlight who put on a great oh. webinar this week with uh, Ron Tite. And, oh yeah. Uh, who's a phenomenal speaker. And he was talking about, you know, just an industry that uh, reinvented itself. And, and it was about um, travel agents. And when mm -hmm. travel agents, when the technology came out that we could all DIY, um, making our hotel reservation, making our travel booking, whatever we could, right? Because the platforms were there to do it ourselves. Um, it was, you know, oh, well, the travel agent's going to, you know, not exist any longer. There's no role for it. Um, and yet uh, the travel agents through this have been absolutely indispensable. They mm -hmm. have fought for their clients. They have, you know, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And, and he was saying about just moving and, and doing a trusted advisor. And I, I just wonder if there's hope for site selection such as yourself for Conference Direct, for, for people that have niche expertise, if there's that trusted advisor, if people will say, I don't want to find myself in that situation again, um, and you know, uh, not having solid counsel. Um, anyways, I just wondered if you thought that yeah. that might be uh, something No, that... it's definitely a, what our company um, believes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yes, I'm very, very hopeful that Stephen and I will start to grow business with, with different clientele after this, um, not only because maybe they're looking for a trusted advisor, but they may be losing um, manpower internally to do it, right? Yeah. So with, again, yeah. with everyone getting laid off or with groups or uh, companies having to downsize in one way, shape or form, um, they now lack the time to do it. And so that's, yeah. that's I guess, the biggest, um, one of the bigger benefits we bring to our clients is we're, we're trying to give them some time back so that they can be more strategic in their work as a meeting planner and not get bogged down with the details and the, the nitty gritty of, of having to, to do sourcing and put proposals together and spreadsheets and this and that. So we're hopeful, you're right, that they they can, we, we see business from companies that see the value in having yeah. an outsourced um, well, extension of their existing team. And that's what um, I've always is, thought about, you know, like yeah. they secure the very best AV fit, they secure the very best speaker fit, they secure the very best venue fit, they secure like, and so that whole, you know, um, I think if there's an opportunity for planners is to find that niche market and, and to really is it specialized? I, I don't know. Like it, to me, specialization is is important, and yet maybe it will be that you are the jack of all trades to be able to be flexible and nimble to respond to whatever's needed. I don't know, but uh, um, yeah, I, I just I wonder if if event hosts will be more cautious and and seek out um, more resources in in what they're doing. So. Yeah, you know, um, I know keep me up at night. Yeah, <laughs> well, but that and that's and that's what I think what I love about our industry is we're always um, we're like now going back to the omniverts and the amniverts. We are amphibians. <laughs> we're always changing, right? We're yeah, changing yeah. our value proposition. How I managed my business insight selection 13 years ago is completely different mm. to how I manage it today. And if I'm still lucky enough to be insight selection 10 years from now, it'll look different yet sure. again, whether that's driven by the economy, driven by client demand, driven by my skill sets and what I can bring to the table. Yeah. So, you know, I think our industry is always going to be changing. Um, and I think, I think that's the kind of person I think if Heidi and I have seen, it's that adaptable person, that person willing to, to tap into, you know, who they are and what they're about and, and draw on that, but yet be mm -hmm. adaptable and shift and respond. Um, I think that's one thing that we have definitely seen in how planners have responded to this time is, is they've taken what has come at them and, you know, breathe, 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 breathe. That's a common response when yeah. we ask planners, what should you do? Just breathe, you know, take, take time to, to see the bigger picture um, and then adapt and, and be flexible and, and not, you know, there's not one way to do something. And I, I think that that skill set, that inherent skill set that people that are drawn to this industry have, I think mm -hmm. uh, hopefully will play out um, and serve them well. So. So the book I'm reading right now, again, not COVID related, but it certainly is 
poignant during this uncertain time. I'm reading Seth Godin's Lynchpin. Are you, okay. do you, are you a Seth Godin girl? No, I haven't. No. Oh, I love him. I want to adopt yeah. him. He's just, well, he's just, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's bigger than all of us put yeah. together. He's, yeah. Yeah. he's a marketing guru. He's okay. anyways, brilliant mind, brilliant mind. Yeah. And anyways, Lynchpin talks about not being the robot, but being the person that, it's not even creating change. Of course, I can't think of it because it's Seth who thinks of these things, not me. But I think our industry is full of linchpins and full of mm. people who make themselves indispensable by going against what's written in the manual and doing something outside of the box or whatever, whatever phrase you want to use. And they, they push the boundaries or they create yeah. something new and, and et cetera, so on. And it's those planners, it's those hotel salespeople the linchpins, the un indispensable people. Um, but the ones who don't change, this could be unfortunately not a great time for them because as our industry shrinks a little bit, we, we could end up losing those who aren't willing to change. And like I said, the hotel sales job people, they just wanted to write contracts and move on and write contracts and move on. And unless you're willing to adapt right now, that's, that's not the hotel sales manager's future right from here on in it's a lot oh. of diplomacy a lot of advocacy and if you're not wired that way um you're you're in trouble as a hotel or the willingness manager. to change how you're wired yeah right? exactly like the willingness to and, and maybe the direction because maybe you just don't know if that's what you've been trained to do and that's your role and you know how do you do i know for myself I, there's lots of things that i look back on the last 25 years of being in the industry and i and it's because of coaching or because of, you know, other people taking the time to show me a different way or maybe even a better way, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's the willingness, I think, to to change. So hopefully mm -hmm. those folks that are maybe in an obsolete kind of uh, find themselves that way will will hopefully have the, the bandwidth to say, I want to change. Um, yeah. And and uh, yeah. I don't know. And hopefully, I, and, and I'm hopeful that the brands and the corporations that hire, um, whether it's a sales manager or even a meeting planner, I hope they recognize that, that change is a good thing and that change mm -hmm. will benefit their organization and corporation and not try and stick those people again back into that robot model of doing things because the robot model has now changed. So ho I'm hopeful that organizations don't expect those people to go back to doing what they always did because they won't be successful if they do. Well, and you, I know you've had far more of a front line to that than I have because you, the volume of, of contracts that you look at and the interaction, I'm, re I'm a step removed from that in what I do for clients because I don't interface directly with the sales. But yeah, I can only imagine when I was, when I was outsourcing venues for planning clients, I certainly... Um, I would often say, I just don't know how you do it. I just don't know how you do it day in, day out. Um, yeah. And I had such respect for, you know, yeah, it was frustrating sometimes. I, I'm not going to, you know, rose colored glasses here. It was, you know, it could be frustrating, but yet at the same time, could not even fathom what some of them, the, the, the pressure that was on mm -hmm. that particular role to, to make sales and to be out there and to be doing it and to be, mm -hmm. you know, grinding it. I just, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how you do it or why you choose it. It wasn't for me, but, and so I, I, I do hope that they have a different work environment to go back to that maybe has mm -hmm. some more balance and maybe some more respect for, for what they did and, and the business that they put in the bums that they did put in the beds. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's not going to be me. I'm yeah. telling you, I'm never going to that yeah. side. I, I will retire alongside my husband before I go back out into into that kind of, uh, you know, daily kind of grind because uh, it just it never was me. Uh, but I, I certainly feel for people that that uh, did that role because I, I just could I couldn't have done it. I, I just yeah. admire how they kept it up. So yeah. well, I'm um, my and then again, this is all pre pre the hammer and pre COVID my, I guess, selling philosophy has always been about relational selling. And that's mm. really where my blog started is I, I had enough experience with these people and enough best practices and enough groaners that I could put together content to show other hotel sales managers, how planners respond to hotel mm. sales managers. And that's really the premise of my blog is 
these are things that I will respond to you for. And these are things that I just will not, I just don't hear you. And, and I think now post COVID, it's going to get even more interesting about what, what they're doing to get our attention and what they're doing to provide value um, over all the other sales managers who are doing almost the exact same thing they've always done. Not a word of a lie. And, and, it's not a lot of Canadian sales managers, I can tell you that, but uh, I, I get emails almost daily still from hotels giving me the capacities of their ballroom. Mm. That's a post-COVID sales, hotel sales email. Hey, here's the capacity of our ballroom. And it's just like, what? yeah, that's just, that's just not, <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly could see that that, well, actually I get a, an email blast uh, once a week and it's a, hotel review and it's meant for hoteliers I signed up many many years ago and Mm -hmm. it it is interesting that there's just no there doesn't seem to be a sensitivity to what needs to be read or heard or seen Mm -hmm. right now Um, they talk about the guest culture the you know the the company culture there's things about um, you know uh, guest experience and it's just it's like, okay, are you tone deaf? Yeah. Um, I've, I've actually read a couple of the headlines uh, to my husband saying, oh my God, I can't believe that they're sending out, and this is to hoteliers themselves, it's meant for, because uh, I'm always looking for, you know, any angle on contracts, obviously, um, yeah. you know, and what are they talking about so that I can be, because forewarned is forearmed. And uh, I, I just, I feel for, like, it didn't seem to change and maybe, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't get many of them, but it just didn't seem to be responsive to the situation that we're currently in or, or even empathetic or thoughtful. Um, but uh, yeah, and, I, I, yeah. And that's <laughs> where I think you and I have to wonder what, what training will they get going forward? What is that going to look like? If mm. it's going to look the same, or do you expect the same result? Like I, for people now coming into the hotel sales industry, or even, I guess, even the event planner industry, like the chain, the training has to change. This it does. And can't I was actually, be the same old, same old. No, I was going to, yeah. I was going to say, I, I think on the flip side, I think there's training that could happen on our planner side. Um, and yeah. those of us that are, are, because I know that, and I'm guilty. I'll put my hand up. Um, where you know you would say, hey, I need this like next week, and and suppliers partners would bend over backwards to accommodate, and then because of client issues or whatever, or you get busy, <laughs> then you don't you ghost them for three weeks. I'm so guilty, and I apologize to anyone so watching this that I did that too. Mm-hmm. But I think there's I think there's a benefit to both sides really saying we have an opportunity to establish a new kind of relationship that works for both you know, the spray and pray that planners used to do and and not ever taking the time to make it fit or to make it even close to being a good fit. It's just, you know, spray, pray, and we'll get whatever responses we can. That's not fair either. So I think there's room for both sides to maybe just say, this has been a big pause um, for us to really look at how we move forward that is respectful of Mm -hmm. both you know, the workloads and the, and the requirements and the, the obligations and the responsibilities on both sides uh, to say, how can we reinvent this? Um, I know um, the uh, conference theme for PCMA, we had in January, we were talking about breaking barriers. And one of the things mm-hmm. that we were talking about is we need to bust up how we're working together and how do we make it so that it's a great uh, experience when we walk away from one another. Um, and, you know, what does one side need and what do I need? And, you know, how do we, how do we make that work? So it will be very different. Yeah. I'm well, I'm, that's the one event I'm, I'm hoping still hangs on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I know, and I know it's all up in the air and no one can expect it to hang on and no one can be surprised if it canceled, but I'm, I am so cautiously optimistic that that one's still moving forward. Well, I think we all have to have optimism, right? I mean, it'd be a sad, sad day if we lose that. Cause I I think Mm. there's it. uh, uh, Yeah. But again, um, being on the inside, it's difficult decisions because there's just so much it's, it's not just desire, right? It's not desire to have the industry come back. It's the, the economics of it. It's the viability of those that we expect so much of yeah. um, but from the attendees, the sponsors, there, there's just so many considerations and nobody has a, a crystal ball as to, you know, is a eight is six months from now going to be viable. 
is 16 months from now going to be viable? I know. Um, right. I know. And so, it, uh, yeah, difficult decisions that you make in isolation with the best information you have and make the best decision you can and say, well, that's, you know, what we're going to live with. So, yeah, it, uh, yeah. I, I can't wait. Someone was saying that uh, the first industry event, it's going to be like a full body assault because people are just because we are a hugging group, right? Oh, no. We're just going to come hey. together and it's going to be full, full body slams. Like it's not just going to yeah. be this polite hug. It's going to be, oh my God, I haven't seen you in so long. And, you know, it, uh, I yeah. can't wait for that day. Uh, COVID well, and, when, <laughs> and well, and that's the thing. And it's funny because we were, we were even talking about this the other day, my husband and I about um, Italy. And they, okay. they're, they're struggling with this COVID thing, like nobody's business. And, and, and my husband said, well, it's culturally, they mm. do the double kiss. And okay. I'm thinking, yeah, what's going to happen when I see Lynn from Quebec City? Like, because we always <laughs> do the double kiss or Regis, right? And it's yeah. like, you know, the, all of our, our Quebec friends, that's how we expressed, yeah. I love you and I miss you is, is yes. you gave them a hug and you did the double kiss, but, but will we go back to that? Will they go back to that? That's, that's actually the bigger question. Yeah. Or they're going to be like, yeah, no, let's just curtsy. Okay. So now we're <laughs> going to curtsy to everybody. I know back I'm in hoping February, that back in February, it was, you know, like no handshakes and but it's just awkward, right? It's whatever we mm. adapt next is going to be awkward for quite a long time because everything we do is so habitual, right? Like a handshake or our hug is so habitual, but yet we probably can adapt. That might be something a little bit safer and, and a little bit less, you know, contact, but uh, yeah, it's going to be awkward for a while. Well, habitual and trust, right? Yeah. If, if yeah. you won't shake my hand, I don't trust you anymore. And mm. at least that was the body language. Yeah before this right is, yeah, is yeah. the way we shook hands or the way we hugged each other indicated a level of trust and a level of of you know professional intimacy yeah. so how do we know now how do we make how do we gauge how do we measure right i don't know we're gonna have to wink at one another so, or something i guess maybe that's it right eh? yeah but it, but, it, but it has to be a subtle wink it can't be like a <laughs> uh, wink or else yeah <laughs> no there's wrong. so many different know. kinds of winks yeah, i can't now see doing that too. wink to you know robert thompson or who i love and adore but you know like hey robert <laughs> i don't know <laughs> oh i don't envy anybody right no now. yeah <laughs> uh, yeah it's, uh, um, Oh, this is this, you know, I, I am grateful for zoom because you're on the yeah. other side of the country and uh, we can connect and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was fun. This was fun. This, I'm almost out of tea though, which, which is perfect. Well, this lasted, this is an hour long tea mug apparently. There you so, go. Oh, look at you. <laughs> and I don't drink tea, so I'm not going to tell you what is in my mug, but I haven't taken a sip. So I'm still in good spirits an hour oh. later. <laughs> Yeah, actually, well, we can only just, guess what's in there. Well, it's only actually hot water because I was freezing beforehand, oh. so it is actually hot water. But yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah well, funny. you know, we we had a great conversation, a telephone conversation, what what, what three four weeks ago, and said, what can we do? You know, what can we? bring to the table and this has just been delightful I it has um, been and I can't even imagine I, I keep trying to think there's a Facebook world out there that might be listening and it's like okay who cares because I have just thoroughly enjoyed uh having <laughs> you uh seemingly to myself <laughs> oh my gosh so I have to read this to you Heather okay. as you uh -oh. said that I looked at the um <laughs> Facebook live Okay. And for whoever just joined our Facebook live feed, we're almost done. But thank you uh, for joining. We have six people. You are never going to guess who one of the six is. <laughs> our beautiful friend, Lynn from Quebec City. <laughs> she, uh, says, she says, you gals are too funny. I agree with Heather. We will be clanging to each other. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll go back and, and we'll put on, you know, disinfected <laughs> from head to toe. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I, I know there's a lot of negative and I, I look at a lot of it and I, you know, but I, I really truly am an optimist at heart. And I, I believe that, that we will come and we'll be together again. It, uh, how it is may change. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, I, anyone that has children, I think that's a message you give your children, right? Is that, that, you know, this too shall pass. Yes, it might be different, but this will pass and you'll be fine. And I mm -hmm. think that's just a message we need to remind ourselves of is that this too shall pass. 
we will be fine. It may be different. Um, <sighs> and I uh, love that. Yeah. You know, like I think we'll adjust because we want, I think we want to be together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, and, and if it's not in a professional capacity, I think there's so many people in this industry that want to be together just because they are, they want to be together as people, not because mm -hmm. they're together as professionals. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's cool too. So oh. but, uh, yeah. Oh, you just end things on such a lovely oh. note because that, <laughs> that's good advice for everybody. You're right. Not just you and me, but for kids, for older people, for everybody. So I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, I love oh. you. So. It's so oh, cool. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> and I may well, hug you when I see you, even if well, I'm not allowed. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we'll figure well, it out. Chris, we'll, well, you know what we could do? You were at PCMA last year. Do you yeah. remember Krista and I going butt to butt? I mean, you're not exchanging anything there. And if I can do it on a stage in front of anybody, maybe Krista and I were just ahead of our time. Really, literally, right? I got I mean, a picture of that. I, I remember know. that. <laughs> so maybe we just were revolutionary and we didn't even know it, right? Maybe we'll just go up right. and back up to everybody. So there All right, go. so I'm going to butt kiss you then the next time I see you. Well, you'll know you met something then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Leanne. Oh, it was, no. It's been delightful. Thank you. So. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, maybe we should do this again. We'll see if Lynn lets well, us would, do this again. That would be cool. <laughs> that would be very, very cool. I would All love right. that. So take okay. good care of yourself. Stay safe. Stay well. Miss you lots. Okay. We'll see you soon. Bye, Bye Heather.